The video where a guy cuts his wiener off and removes his balls with a knife and hatchet is one of the most requested videos for me to cover. The BME Pain Olympics. Some say it's fake, some say it's real and the guy died, and all this confusion is understandable. Because you see, there's actually several things that have been called the BME Pain Olympics throughout the years. And because there's so many different stories and videos with different happenings, the truth about them has gotten pretty murky over the years. So for today's episode of Tales from the Internet, let's take a closer look at this CBT legend. If you've ever gone online and looked up anything to do with tattoos, piercings, or body mods from the mid-90s on, chances are you came across a website called BME, the Body Modification e -Zine. This is one of, if not the first website dedicated entirely to body mods, and it was definitely the largest one. I remember coming across this website when I was a teenager looking for tattoo ideas and information about what to expect when I get went to get my eyebrows pierced. Like there was a period in time when I had like two eyebrows pierced, two lip rings, and a ton of earrings. I have no pictures of that, but trust me. And I'm sure a lot of the millions of people who came across that website had a similar story. BME was created in 1994 by Canadian programmer Shannon Larat. The more I read about this guy while I was working on the video, the more I came to admire him. He's a guy who reminds me of people like Max Goldberg of YTMND, Soylent from Rotten.com, in the sense that he just really embodied this spirit of the early internet, a guy that's just gonna do whatever the fuck he feels like, censorship be damned. So Shannon developed an interest in body mods from a very young age. In an interview, he noted that this might have been influenced by his fascination with stories he heard from his neighbor growing up, who was a Blackfoot native. And as he's growing up, he teaches himself how to program, and by the age of 16, he's already working as a professional programmer. And while he's developing software for gambling websites and psychic hotlines, he's working on his passion project on the side, BME. And after he launches the site, he quickly dives in headfirst and makes it his full-time focus. As he put it in an interview with a college student that he shared on his blog, I'd rather fail chasing my dreams than succeed as a slave. But he didn't fail, in fact, BME became massively successful. Much more successful than he had ever considered, becoming the online source for all things tattoos, piercings, and body mods. And some of the things featured on the site were very extreme mods that most people would never consider doing, but were interesting to look at and read about nonetheless. But like a lot of boundary pushing websites at the time, and you're probably expecting this if you've seen my channel before, but he got in a little bit of trouble with the law because of the website. There's a few cases of this, but to me the most interesting one is what happened with Germany. Germany goes on this spree where they're banning edgy websites because, you know, think of the children. BME is one of the websites and he gets a notification that, hey, like, if you want your website to be viewed in Germany, you gotta make some changes. But of course, Shannon said fuck that, didn't change anything about his website, didn't censor anything, and went as far as to print a t-shirt to antagonize the German authorities, egging people on to wear it, which was technically illegal because it showed the website URL. And although many, probably most viewers of BME just kind of pass through to view the content and read the stories, there were those who stuck around, and a very strong sense of community began to form. As this tight-knit community grows, BME starts to have meetups, barbecues, and eventually a large annual event called BME Fest. And in 2002, at one of these barbecues, a new tradition began. The BME Pain Olympics. But this event I'm talking about in 2002 probably isn't what you're thinking about. Some of the games at this inaugural BME Pain Olympics included drinking hot sauce and carrying weight while suspended. And while these things can be painful and challenging, I'm sure they're a far cry from the images that came to your head when I said BME Pain Olympics. And some images from other Pain Olympics events are still viewable on the BME website. And they show stuff like needles being placed through the skin with sterile gloved hands. Once again, kinda rough. I probably wouldn't do it, but a far cry from what you think when you hear BME Pain Olympics. I mean, you definitely don't think of anything sterile at all. But you know what? Some of you might actually not have any idea what the fuck I'm talking about when I'm referencing all this, so allow me to describe the BME Pain Olympics video that everyone's thinking of. So when the video starts, the song Living Like a Zombie by the metal band Mortification plays as we're introduced to the first challenger, who's smacking a knife against his penis that's placed on a cutting board. Contestant 2 comes in and he's tying his balls up with a string. Contestant 1's back and now he's tying his whole penis up with a string and he places it back on the cutting board. Back to entrant 2, who's chopping away at his balls with a little hand axe now. 
while Entrant 1 takes a knife to his dick and starts to slice it up. Entrant 2 keeps chopping away at his balls while Entrant 1 sticks a knife in and individually pops out each testicle one by one. I said one by one, like there's a whole bunch of them, but you know, there's just two. And that's where the video ends and it never tells us who won. Although, speaking logically, the guy who cut his dick and balls off would have to win over the guy who just cut his balls off, right? It's unclear when this video was actually made, and several sources, like imdb.com, say that it was made in 2002. But it can't possibly have been made in 2002 because the song that plays during it wasn't released until 2004. What I think happened here is that people read about the BME Pain Olympics happening at the barbecue, so I th they thought it was those BME Pain Olympics. And not, you know, the hot sauce drinking in suspension. And going by Google Trends and the dates on the massive amount of YouTube reaction videos, this video seems to have been made, or at the very least, first made its way around the internet in 2007. And of course, there were a shit ton of reaction videos done to this. I mean, we are only a few months removed from Two Girls, One Cup, so of course everyone's gonna come in for part two. At this point, you even had people like a pre-JRE Joe Rogan going in and making videos about it. And this legitimately was a rough video to watch. I mean, even looking back at it several times for making this video, I was kind of like, eh. So when I would hear people saying that this thing was fake, I was like, there's, there's no way. And here's where it gets a little confusing for a bit, because here's where you start seeing different people saying different things. Something that I saw come up a few times was that the BME Pain Olympics was done with hot dogs, and I'm like, no. Definitely not. But the reason some people think it was done with hot dogs was because there was a video and a Pain Olympic site that showed some guy sticking a hot dog through his fly and cutting it up and mangling in all different ways. And the video was so low quality and so dark that at first you kinda can't tell that it's an Oscar Mayer wiener. And knowing that this was making its way around, I thought perhaps people thinking this Pain Olympics video was fake was just a case of people mixing up two different videos. But I'll give the final word on this to Shannon himself, who made an appearance in a Reddit thread in 2012 when someone made a post asking for an AMA of a Pain Olympics participant. I'm the person who created this video, as well as all the BME series of videos. Yes, the one called BME Pain Olympics is faked footage, and I would have thought that was obvious to anyone looking at it, but I guess not everyone has the encyclopedic knowledge of what it looks like when you chop up someone's genitals that I have. However, the various BME torture trailers and related videos are completely real and contain arguably more extreme footage. And reading this, I was a little taken aback because, you know, even if this was faked somehow, to me, it looked so real. Like, how could this be obviously fake, you know? So, of course, I went back and I watched the video several times. And each time with this knowledge in mind, it started to look a little bit more fake. I think part of the effect is that when you see something like this, your eyes are just trying to not focus so intently on it. But when you give it a close look, you notice things like, oh, there's like not really as much blood as you would expect here. And granted, sometimes gore in real life just doesn't look the way you would think. But on closer inspection, I think the dead giveaway is how the penis moves while it's being cut. It just doesn't seem to have the right density. He's cutting it in such a way that it should flop a little, but the penis doesn't flop. Once you take note of how it moves, it almost starts to resemble a lump of Play-Doh, and I imagine that if this thing was shot in 1080p, it would be way more obvious, as Shannon said. The theory had also been presented on the now-deleted Pain Olympics Wikipedia entry that this was made of some real footage. The real footage belonged to BME users of Rebly and Kokomi 3K. I couldn't see Kokomi's content, but there was a picture of a Rebly tying his balls off and shoving a nail through his testicles, so it seems to check out, and apparently his name has become synonymous with CBT, so it makes sense. In fact, it's said that at the end of this video, there was originally a notice that it was all fake, and it was part of BME's April Fool's tradition. Every year they would post some kind of fake article, including things like a couple from the community who bit each other's fingers off as a show of dedication, a UFO cult that built a new species of human, a guy who got plastic surgery to look like an alien, and one that I actually remember from back in the day about a pair of twins who got their body parts transplanted onto each other. That being said, in this post, Shannon also made reference to BME torture trailers which he said were real. And in fact, you can still find these trailers in the videos directory of his blog. Sometimes these videos would also make their way around to get labels like BME Pain Olympics for various years or various entry numbers. And the videos featured things like 
Firecrackers in the urethra, batteries in the urethra, large vegetables shoved up the urethra. You, you get the gist of what these are like. And so all that being said, why the fuck would anybody do this? Shannon has an explanation. They're real-life Cenobites. They're explorers of nerve impulses. They're seeking the extremes of sensation, a far-out realm where pleasure and pain are all blurred. To simplify, they're doing it because they're getting off on it. There are other reasons too, but that's the main one. And the healthy one. A year after he spoke to Reddit in 2013, Shannon would pass away. He took his own life after dealing with years of chronic, constant pain from a genetic muscular condition. After his death, a blog post he had prepared was published. In the blog post, he details how the little treatment he did receive was ineffective. He struggled to get the pain management that he needed and he felt that the reason was that because of his appearance, the doctors thought he was just looking for drugs. He also reflected on BME, the state of the body modification community at the time, and his hopes for it in the future. And he was sure to show appreciation for everything he accomplished and everyone who helped him along the way. He concluded by offering his ashes to friends who were aware of his situation and asked them previously about it, so that they can use them in art and their own personal body modification projects. He said that he loved the idea of living on in this way after his death. And really, he still lives on in so many other ways. It cannot be understated how influential he was in shaping the culture around us, creating a platform where millions of people learned about tattoos, piercings, and body mods. How it made so many people feel okay with it in a world where it wasn't as socially accepted as it is today. And how different the world looks because he was here. Pornography is something that has historically always been enjoyed in private, away from the judging eyes of friends, family, and the general public. For the most part. And the more depraved it gets, the further we retreat into the shadows, hoping to hide our shame from the light of day. I can think of at least one glowing exception to this behavior, though. An exception in which, rather than keeping it secret, millions of people opted to share it with those closest to them, and sometimes, millions of complete strangers on the internet. This is the story of the time a filthy porn clip got turned into a communal experience for people around the world. This is the story of two girls, one cup. The other day I saw a bunch of people tweeting about a vegan milkshake made out of hummus and it suddenly reminded me of perhaps the most infamous viral shock video of all time. Of course, I'm talking about Two Girls One Cup. Obviously, I can't actually show this one to you here, but in case you somehow missed it, Two Girls One Cup was a montage of two girls dramatically eating poop out of a cup. And after they ate it, they took turns puking it into each other's mouths, alternating roles as Mama Bird and Baby Bird. And all this goes on as a classy piano theme from a 1971 French film plays. But where did this thing come from? The Two Girls One Cup story begins when this video clip was posted to the offtopic.com forums in the After Hours section. The video quickly gained a lot of attention on these forums as it seemed to do wherever it was posted. Wanting a way to quickly share the video with friends, a user named Cajones purchased the URL 2girls1cup.com and he created the now infamous website on August 12, 2007. And he quickly forgot about it until his hosting service came knocking on his door looking for money. During the first month of the site being up, I had encountered some issues. At that time, I had no care for the site and had even forgotten that the site existed. Until one day where it was brought to my attention that I owed some money to the hosting company due to bandwidth overages. At that time, I thought it was some sort of mistake. Either that or the company was trying to get some money out of me. It was all confirmed that I did indeed exceed bandwidth usages and I directed myself to my analytics account. And if we look at the analytics screenshot that Cajones posted, it was on August 20th that the site really began to take off. It was at that point that Two Girls One Cup had begun to make its way far outside the original intended audience of OffTopic.com users and became a viral shock site in the great tradition of GoatSea.cx, Meatspin.com, or LemonParty.org. But unlike a lot of the shock sites that came before it, TwoGirls.com evolved into something that people weren't looking at by accident, but on purpose. And it was the trend of people reacting to Two Girls One Cup that really propelled it to the heights that it reached. The first such video was believed to have been uploaded to YouTube on September 21st, 2007 by a user named Fartnoot. As of the time of this recording, Fartnoot's video now has over 14 million views. 
and Fartnute's success inspired a whole wave of people to start putting their reactions out there. Practically overnight, YouTube became flooded with people sharing their reactions to Two Girls, One Cup, and their family members' reactions too. And although reaction videos had existed to some extent previously, what we were witnessing here was the true genesis of the personality-driven reaction format that would wind up taking over YouTube for years. It's kind of fitting that the reaction video genre was basically spawned by literal shit. And on October 11th, the site's traffic literally doubled overnight, going from 100,000 views to 200,000 views. And those numbers would more than double the next month. At this point, Cojones had hired a tech-savvy friend to help deal with the maintenance of the site, and additionally, he began to monetize it with ads. But the money wasn't really what excited Cojones. Rather, it was the thrill of being the man behind the shit-stained curtain. At this point, everything was Rick Ross, boss, and we felt on top of the world. Not because we were making some money off the site, but more so because of all the attraction the site had received. I felt like an undercover superstar. I would walk around Chicago and listen to people talk about Two Girls One Cup, and I would always giggle inside knowing that it was me who created the site. It was kind of a cool feeling, but at the same time, I felt awkward for exposing something so disgusting. The fad had gone from something that was intended really just for the consumption of a specific message board to a full-blown mainstream sensation. It was at this point that celebrities started to weigh in, you had John Mayer making his parody of it. And although he was eating yogurt in it as a spoof, there were a lot of people who questioned the authenticity of the shit in the video. A lot of people thought that perhaps they had done some kind of movie magic, like what they did with Marmalade and Salo. There was a lot of debate over this, and fittingly, it was summarized really well by perhaps the only other figure in porn as mainstream as Two Girls One Cup, Ron Jeremy. They probably substituted it for pistachio ice cream. No, I believe that's the real deal. No, I don't think that. I don't think it you is. You don't think it is? All right, keep watching. You might have substituted. Keep watching. Yeah. How could they go that much? Girls like don't, that don't, don't go that much. What, do you think they're men? You've had girlfriends this you small. Saw they you think they're men? Girls have little balls when they go to the bathroom. You and this debate was actually more important than people realized. In fact, the U.S. government was quite concerned with the provenance of the shit featured in Two Girls, One Cup. In 2005, under the Bush administration, the Department of Justice created a new organization known as the Obscenity Prosecution Task Force. Their job was to prosecute people involved in the production and distribution of porn that they believed to be in violation of obscenity laws. And one of the men who was prosecuted by this organization was a pornographer and self-described shock artist named Ira Isaacs. When Isaacs was prosecuted, there was a lot of confusion created by news sites that falsely reported that he was the creator of Two Girls, One Cup. He was actually prosecuted for a number of different scat films, but the confusion was created when he used Two Girls, One Cup to justify his defense of Hollywood Scat Amateurs 10. His arguments would become popularly dubbed the Two Girls, One Cup Defense. Until I saw Two Girls, One Cup, I wouldn't have thought so many regular people would want to watch this stuff. There are millions of people watching it. For now, it's probably most people like the shock value of it. This is art that asks questions about what's ugly, acceptable, taboo. It takes something mundane, like going to the bathroom, and puts it in a new light. It inspires people. Just because it has sex in it, and deals with a subject matter that isn't typically in art, doesn't mean it isn't art. Getting the court to decide that Isaac's films were in fact art was key to fighting off the obscenity case. But unfortunately for Ira Isaacs, the court didn't see things his way. After several years of mistrials and delays, it was found that Ira Isaacs was guilty of obscenity. And because of this, Ira Isaacs was sentenced to four years in prison. And due to the shabby reporting of a number of websites and the fact that few people actually saw their corrections, this led to a rumor that the creator of Two Girls, One Cup was actually in jail for making it. In fact, the creator of Two Girls, One Cup is very much free and has never been jailed for his work. Two Girls, One Cup was actually the trailer to a larger film entitled Hungry Bitches. This film was created in Brazil by a director named Marco Antonio Fiorito. And although the film was perfectly legal to distribute inside of Brazil, when it made it to the US, it got on the radar of Bush's task force. And it was on September 5th of 2006 when a criminal complaint was raised against a Brazilian man in Florida named Danilo Simoes Croces. 
The complaint details a several year investigation beginning in 2003 into two film distribution companies, Dragon Films and Lexus Media. It describes in detail a film entitled Toilet Man 6, as well as a number of other films all created by Marco Antonio Fiorito. To help the judge along, it also goes on to define terms like scat, bukkake, and fisting. And the complaint ends with a statement implicating Danilo. As noted above, Croce is identified as the officer, director, treasurer, president for Lexus Multimedia on filings that were submitted to the Florida Secretary of State. In addition, Croce opened and controlled the bank accounts of Lexus Multimedia and received portions of the proceeds that were made from the sale of videos and downloads by Lexus Multimedia, among other things. And at the request of Danilo's attorney, Marco Antonio Fiorito issued a statement. This statement is the only publicly known record of Fiorito addressing his work. He begins it by discussing his own history. In 1994, I became interested in producing films and on my own, I learned the art of filmmaking. In 1996, I started a business with my wife, Joelma Brito Fiorito, who used the artistic name Leticia Miller. The business was producing fetish films. At that time, my wife and I did everything. We were the actors, the producers, as well as the filming. Sometimes we hired other people to operate the camera. We made these films to sell. When we started, the only films that we made were about feed fetishes. I placed ads in the local newspapers offering fetish films. The people that were interested called a phone number in the ad and I told them about the available fetish films. The buyers would place an order and I would personally deliver the videos to their homes, where I would collect the money for the sale of the videotapes. When the business started making money, we started to hire other actors for the films. He goes on to explain how he eventually partnered with a man named Luis Villas Boas, who was much more adept at business and helped him grow things. In 1999, I received a call from Luis Villas Boas, who had seen the newspaper ad and he was interested in knowing more about my business. Luis and I decided to meet personally. We met and I explained to Luis how my business operated. Luis suggested that the business could be on the internet. I did not understand anything about how the business could operate via the internet, so Luis explained and showed me how it would operate on the internet. I found this idea very interesting and that is when Luis and I began our partnership. The partnership was called Dragon Films. Luis helps Marco grow the business, he begins acquiring URLs, and he begins hiring new staff, and that's where Danilo comes into the picture. And this is where it starts to get pretty funny, because Marco did not like Danilo. I have met Danilo. I don't remember exactly when I met him for the first time, but I'm sure it was some years after I started the business with Luis. As I have mentioned before, I am a fetishist and I consider myself a person that is a compulsive fetishist and therefore I spend a lot of money on fetishism. Louise noticed this licentious behavior. It was at this time that Louise introduced me to Danilo. Our first meeting was at my home in Sao Paulo and Danilo came with Louise. I found out that the reason Louise introduced me to Danilo was to show me that if I could control my addiction, I could be a more successful person financially. When I was introduced to Danilo Croce, I didn't like him. Since that time, I have seen Danilo a few times and always in social events, not ever in any business context. In fact, Marco's dislike for Danilo was so intense that he actually went out of his way to troll him. I always used my name in the fetish films that I produced. Letitia Miller used her name in the fetish films. Many of the actors in the fetish films used fictitious names. I decided, as a joke, to put the name Daniel Cross on a person in the fetish films. When I used the name Danny Cross, I already knew Danilo Croce, and I knew that Daniel Cross is the American way of saying Danilo Croce. So I thought it would be a joke to use the name Danny Cross, representing an influential person participating in my films. Sometime later, Louise told me that he had met Danilo and that he made a comment about his name joke, and that Danilo became very mad because of this. Louise also told me that Danilo requested that his name be removed from all the films. I didn't do this because I was not worried about the repercussions of this fact, and also because Danny Cross is not Danilo Croce's name. He also commented on the legality of his films. The films that I make are not illegal in Brazil, and I didn't imagine they were illegal in the United States of America. I have already searched the internet, saw many American companies that sell this type of film on the internet, so I didn't imagine these films were illegal in the USA. Nobody ever told me that producing or having this type of film would be illegal in the USA. And because I don't participate in any of the administrative matters of the business, I don't know any of the contact from the American government informing us that these films, or the sale of these films, was considered illegal. 
If I knew that the sale of these films via the internet was illegal, I would have stopped because the money is not the main reason that I make these films. And finally, he remarked about what's perhaps the most important part. Was the poop real? I have already made fetish movies with scat slash feces using chocolate instead of feces. Many actors make scat films, but they don't agree to eat feces. Ultimately, Marco's statement did no favors for Danilo, who was sentenced to three years probation and ordered to pay $98,000. And I imagine Marco had a good laugh when he got that news. As for the Two Girls One Cup website, Cajones explains its decline. As mentioned earlier, the site was reaching its peak. The following month, December 12th to January 12th, the site brought in 8 million visits, to then follow by January, February, which brought in 5 million visits. At this point, we had been cut from all revenue sources due to the site nature and were losing money quick. We were barely breaking even for server costs and all the other good stuff. We eventually sold the site in February and washed our hands with it. The new owners did some super shady shit like require a credit card to view the video, which I was totally against for, but there wasn't anything I could have done. And although he could not legally give an exact figure, Cajone stated that it was at least six figures he was paid. And thus concludes the two girls one cup story. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Seems like half the time I want to stream a movie is just not available in my region. But Nord has over 5400 servers in 59 different countries, so you can appear to look like you're wherever. Recently I wanted to watch Quentin Tarantino's second most underrated movie, Death Proof, but it's not available where I live. So Nord helped me pretend to be a Canadian, and now I can look at it. And you can do this on all your devices. One account lets you connect up to six devices. To get started, go to nordvpn.com slash wang. You'll get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus four free months. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Just go to nordvpn.com slash wang. There is a lesson that every internet user has to learn sooner or later. I've been deceived. Look before you click. And now, the ways we've all learned this lesson have changed a lot over the years. For the latecomers, they basically learned this lesson through things like Rickrolls. And in the Windows XP days, you basically just clicked the wrong link and got a ton of viruses. <laughs> Screamers, that was another one. But the classic way to learn this lesson is through a shock site. Your friend sends you a link on AIM, oh check out this funny website, and you click it and it's not a funny website. It's something totally nasty and not at all what you were expecting. And there's been a lot of those throughout the years, but before Meat Spin, before Tub Girl, before Lemon Party, there was one site that set the standard. And that's why today I'm going to tell you the story of the great granddaddy of them all. This is the legend of Goatsea. Goatsy is probably the most famous shock website to have ever existed on the internet, and probably the first one that you remember. On the off chance that you don't know what Goatsy.cx was, though, basically you clicked the link and you were treated to the site of a guy bent over with his hands dug way into his ass, stretching it as wide as you could imagine, wider than thought humanly possible. Obviously, I can't show this to you on YouTube. What I can show you is some of the many references people made to it. The site also contained another pic nicknamed The Giver, which depicted a guy with a giant cock, but that image was nowhere near as famous as The Receiver, Probably because once you clicked on Goatsy.cx, you didn't really stick around that long. The way most people came across the website was basically like a prank, like a Rickroll where your friend sends you a link and aim, a message board, email, and you click on it, and then bam, there's a fucking giant asshole in your face. So let's go to the beginning of Goatsy. The site began in 1999 with just the basic giver and receiver images and a counter of how many people had visited the website. 
In just a few months, the site had received over 300,000 views, which was absolutely ridiculous for the time. However, the counter was eventually reset possibly accidentally and then deleted altogether. And from that point on, Goatsy would undergo occasional updates. At one point, both pictures were removed and the site merely read, What are you doing here? Although I can't be 100% certain, I think that that update might have signaled the beginning of their ongoing legal troubles. And Goatsy did eventually inspire legislation relating to misleading links online. US Code 2252C Misleading words or digital images on the internet. In general, Whoever knowingly embeds words or digital images into the source code of a website with the intent to deceive a person into viewing material constituting obscenity shall be fined under this title and imprisoned for not more than 10 years. Whether or not legal threats had anything to do with the images being removed, they were shortly returned but now with a disclaimer. This site contains content that may be offensive to some audiences and is certainly intended for a mature audience, not to mention one with a good sense of humor. For this reason, the maintainers of this site would like to request that discretion and common sense please be used in sharing the link to this site, especially in the case of posting to a public forum that may be available to minor audiences. Finally, the maintainers cannot, for obvious reasons, be responsible for the actions of third parties. And this disclaimer was quickly changed to a much less professional sounding one. The GoatSea.CX lawyer has informed us that we need a warning. So, if you are under the age of 18 or find this photograph offensive, please don't look at it. Thank you. Of course, by the time you've read this disclaimer, you already got a face full of asshole. As the site's reputation grew, it also began to aggregate links to other weird websites, in particular urinalpoop.com, which I had covered previously on the channel, and dolphinsex.org, which I plan on possibly eventually covering. In 2003, the site was once again updated, this time with the promise of merch. Important note, there are many merchandising attempts for GoatSea.CX around the web. None of them are real. None of them are official. Did not buy this gimmick merchandise. The official GoatSea.CX merchandise is coming soon. This promise, however, would go unfulfilled as GoatSea.CX was removed from the internet in January of 2004. You see, .cx websites belong to an Australian territory named Christmas Island. And it was a resident busybody of Christmas Island named Ronza Clark who went through the trouble of filing a formal complaint to get GoatSea.cx taken down. Her litany of grievances included numerous posts with embedded links to internet forums and news groups which do not contain warnings of adult or obscene content, I can watch United Nations Internet Forum, among others. Links to unlawful obscene content, site which describes how to have sex with dolphins. A representative of the Christmas Island Internet Administration, Garth Miller, quickly reviewed the complaint. I appreciate that the Christmas Island community takes immense pride in its natural beauty, of which the spinning dolphins are an important part, and note that the links to the Dolphin Sex website would have been highly offensive to the users of the IT center, particularly children. As the link clearly constitutes a breach of the spirit and letter of the terms of use which prohibits communication, publication, or distribution either directly or by way of embedded links of images or materials where that communication, publication, or distribution would constitute a criminal offense, as you will note from the attached Nation Master article, GoatSea.CX is a well-known shock site, which is intended, one can assume, to be humorous. Although we have received numerous informal complaints, most have raised objections to the images. Although the images could generally be considered to be are offensive and crude, they do not represent child or other forms of illegal pornography. By internet standards, the imagery, although intentionally offensive, is relatively tame. In other words, Garth has seen some shit. The intentional boasting of embedded links without useful disclaimer to a site which contains obscene or adult content is a violation of the CIIA AUP and terms of use of our network. Generally, CIIA prefers to work with registrants to cure minor breaches which may have occurred or which they may not be aware of. Registrants are generally given an opportunity to cure a breach before a final decision on an AUP complaint is made. In the case of GoatSea.CX, which contains only two prominent links at the bottom of the site, one of which is to the Dolphin Sex site, 
It is hard to fathom that the registrant was not aware that this would not constitute a violation of the AUP. As noted in the attached article, Goatsy.cx is not a passive website and homepage or the like, but one of the internet's more popular shock sites. It is common practice for many internet trolls and third parties to embed hidden links to the site. There is compelling anecdotal evidence to suggest that most viewers to the site are in some way tricked into viewing it, and there can be no doubt that the object of the site is to offend its viewers, many of which may be minors. The registrant provides advice that he has received legal advice which has recommended he place a warning on his site, yet this warning appears directly above, and in clear view of an image he himself suggests legally requires a disclaimer. This being the case, I have asked Brad to suspend the site immediately pending further review and notification of the registrant. There can be no doubt that will be viewed by some as censorship and a restriction of freedom of speech. However, the board has specifically drafted policies which give CIIA latitude to act in the absence of a court order when there is a compelling public interest in doing so, prevent the spread and publication of child pornography or other unlawful activity. The freedom of speech does not extend to use of our community-owned network to facilitate unlawful activity or to intentionally harass or offend internet users. So despite the fact that Goatsy.cx couldn't control how other people were using their website, they were still banned. At this point, Goatsy.cx was replaced by a message from the Council of Country Code Administrators, or CACA. So Goatsy.cx was gone, but its legend had already been cemented. And what of the picture itself? A giant spread asshole doesn't just manifest itself through the power of the internet alone. It had to come from somewhere. And it was Encyclopedia Dramatica that broke the story of the Goatsy Man's identity. One very persistent internet user spent months and months trawling all the gay erotica and anal stretching newsgroups and eventually located the star of this picture by matching the pattern of moles on his ass. It is with many lulls that ED advises the world that the Goatsy guy's real name is Kirk Johnson and he posts pictures and videos of himself regularly on the newsgroup alt.binaries.erotica.mail.anal. The original Goatsy picture was part of a series of many more images that was originally uploaded in 1997. The pictures made their way through newsgroups, message boards, and eventually styleproject.com before reaching legendary status on Goatsy.cx. And throughout the years, there have been many death hoaxes about Kirk Johnson, beginning with a post on somethingawful.com alleging that he died from shoving a volleyball up his ass. However, he's definitely alive, at least as of two years ago, keeping an active online presence posting to his channels on Pornhub and other websites. And like Kirk Johnson himself, Goatsy.cx wasn't quite done yet. After Kaka had released the URL back into circulation, it had changed hands many times. Mostly through speculators who realized that there was a lot of money to be made by having a very famous website. But nothing was actually done with it until 2010, when Goatsy.cx was set to become an email provider. That's right, you too could have your very own at Goatsy.cx email address. And in 2012, an Indiegogo campaign was launched for the service. The campaign raised over 20 grand, but unfortunately, it never actually came to fruition. Two years later, another video would be released, this time with the promise of Goatsy.cx subdomains. Hi everyone, I'm Kirk Johnson, attorney at law to Goatsy.cx. I just got out of a meeting with the Goatsy board and I have some very important news to share with you. Goatsy is about to undergo its most radical transformation yet. We're making the Goatsy.cx domain available to everyone. Soon, you'll be able to have your very own Goatsy.cx subdomain to host whatever you want. You really can use your subdomain however you like. You can start a web page to host your favorite images, or host a blog with Tumblr or WordPress, or run an IRC server. You could even host your resume to take your career to a new level. But why stop there? You could make your Goatsy subdomain your new corporate presence. The only limits are your imagination and the law. 
If you want to be informed when Goatsy Subdomains launches, leave your email in the box below. As of now, it seems like that hasn't materialized either, which is a damn shame because I would love to have wang.goatsy.cx. And in another video that's been deleted and I couldn't seem to dig up, the Goatsy lawyer returned, this time to promote Dogecoin, and also announced a coming cryptocurrency known as Goatsy Coin. But like all the other projects in the past, it seems like Goatsy Coin never actually materialized either. And this brings us to the present day. If you visit Goatsy.cx now, you'll be greeted by a mostly gray screen with a few small images. One of them being my logo for some reason. Apparently now you can buy pixels on Goatsy.cx for Ethereum and put whatever images you want there, so thank you whoever bought ad space on Goatsy.cx for me. Uh, I feel like you reached out to me at some point and told me you did it, but I don't remember who it was. You're probably watching this video, so please remind me. And considering that whoever it is that actually owns Goatseed.cx seems to keep on trying to make more and more projects, I don't think that this is the last we've heard of that site. But as of now, that's it for the Goatseed story. The year is 2008. The Two Girls One Cup phenomenon had already came and went, but as its image faded in the rearview mirror, the internet found itself experiencing a renaissance of online shock videos. It was like the age of Goatsy revisited, but now, with online video becoming so much more accessible, we could take things to the next level. All of a sudden you had stuff like Two Girls One Finger, Three Guys One Hammer, and probably, most infamously, One Guy One Jar. AKA One Man One Jar, AKA One Guy One Cup. A hero who shoved an entire glass jar up his ass and broke it for the world to see. But what happened when he was left, both literally and figuratively, to pick up the pieces? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of the Jar Man, Alexi. When I was working on this video, I saw a lot of things that made me actually physically squirm, which, you know, this was with the knowledge that I was working on a One Guy One Jar video. Even with that in mind, I didn't expect to see a lot of that stuff, and obviously I can't show you any of it, but I'll do my best to describe it as the video goes on. But I'm sure that most of you are already familiar with One Guy One Jar. I mean, it's one of the most requested things for me to make a video about. The story of One Guy One Jar begins on December 3rd of 2008 on eFucked.com. I'm sure a great many of you are already familiar with eFucked, but if you're not, allow me to give you uh, the cliff notes of the site. eFucked has long been a fixture of the internet, and it remains open to this day. Think of it as kind of the circus of internet porn. You'll find things like porn bloopers, wacky gimmick porn, and sometimes really, really extreme porn. Some examples I saw on the front page while working on this video were Awkward Poor Moments 9, Super Simp Ruins an Orgy, and a deaf girl that's described as the Helen Keller of casual sex. Pretty much everyone that's been around long enough has a story of the craziest thing they saw on eFuck at some point over the past several years. And it was on eFucked that one guy, one cup would first reach the masses. You're one click away from witnessing one of the most unsettling things I've ever posted. I'm still trying to figure out if this was intentional or what. Any ordinary human being would have said, oh fuck, and then proceeded to scream like a gay couple whose marriage just got revoked. This stunner doesn't even make a peep. I don't get it. I'm sure most of you have seen the video by now, but if you haven't, allow me to describe it. A hairy naked man with a heavily lubed up asshole squats over a glass jar. He quickly thrusts down onto it, clenching it with his butt, and then gradually slides the entire 87mm diameter of the glass jar up into his asshole. Like, he literally gets the whole fucking thing in there. And then suddenly, disaster strikes. There's a crack. The jar broke inside of his ass. Blood pours out of him, there is so much blood. And he digs the glass out, piece by piece, not making a sound, and then he just walks out of the frame and that's the end. I'd love to show you a clip, but obviously I can't, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play some of the sounds for you and you can just let your imagination fill in the blanks.
This video quickly spreads all over the internet. The eFuck page is getting millions of views. You got sites like One Man One Jar and One Guy in One Cup re-hosting it. It gets posted to Dig. It gets posted to Reddit. And people are posting reaction videos all over YouTube. Big ass glass shot came on his anus. Essentially, we were reliving the glory days of Two Girls, One Cup, but much more extreme. And we were left asking a lot of questions, too. Primarily, who was this man and what happened to him? It seems like, according to most people, he died. There's absolutely no source for that claim, and yet I've heard it so many times. Even when I mentioned to friends and I mentioned on stream that I was working on this video, a lot of people said, hey, didn't that guy die? So, if you go to the IMDB page for One Man Jar, and yes, it does have an IMDB page, and it has a 7.3 out of 10 stars rating. It identifies the man as Alexei Tatarov, not to be confused with MMA legend Oleg Taktarov, who came up a few times when I was searching for Alexei. These searches eventually led me to find an image or album that supposedly belonged to him. Alex, 1303-1969, with the caption, I'm not gay, just eat funny. This album contains images of him shoving various objects up his stretched anus, and inflicting all kinds of penile torture upon himself, such as very tightly constricting it with some kind of tape that almost made it look like the mushroom platforms from the first Mario Brothers game. And there are pictures of him inserting certain objects into it. Sounding is what they call it. Oh, there actually was a picture of him wearing clothes in a suit sitting cool like AC Slater. Although this very much seemed to be our guy, I mean, how many guys are there going around the internet just shoving big ass jars up their asses? I had a hard time finding any real proof that this was him other than other people's word of mouth. And pretty much every article or post I came across that claimed that this guy was him had people doubting it. So I did what I had to do. I spent hours digging through archives of this Imager album. And I spent those hours analyzing a Russian man's naked body and his apartment and his furniture. As far as I could tell, the penis seems to match. With the uncircumcised foreskin drooping down, looking like Ren's mouth from Ren and Stimpy. But I'm not confident enough in my dick spotting prowess to know for sure that this is the same guy. Nor was I confident enough in my ability to discern the feet or the belly rolls. Really, the key was analyzing the man's surroundings. And there's a lot of different rooms we see this man in in this album, as well as just wandering the streets of Russia naked. A lot of the rooms in these photos, such as the one with the red carpet, were different enough from the video that they could just be ruled out immediately. And then there was another floor that I saw that was kinda close, I thought it was it at first, but no, it is a little bit different, it's another room. And then finally, after I'm starting to think that I put myself through this ordeal for nothing, I find it. It's not a full image. Just a thumbnail for another album that was unfortunately not archived. This means that we can't look at it in its glorious full resolution, but I think the thumbnail has enough clues. Look at the low green baseboard where the wall meets the floor, the cables on the ground, and the edge of what appears to be the same cabinet. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. This means... He didn't die, and the man who claims to be the Jar Man is in fact the Jar Man. And in January of 2009, a month after his video started to spread all over the internet, he started to do a little bit of a PR tour. He made contact with the owner of OneGuyInOneCup.com and sent some pictures that confirmed his identity. Of course, these pictures weren't archived, but they're claimed to contain the pertinent flooring, the plastic bags, and the outlet. Not gonna lie, I'm kinda curious what's in those plastic bags, considering they've been sitting there this whole time. He would also go on to make his presence known to a bunch of different online communities and grant some interviews, the most in-depth of which was given to bestgore.com. In the interview, and in the comments section that followed it, Alex answered basically all of the questions that anybody might have for him. At the time of the interview in 2009, he was a 40-year-old Russian man who worked as a manager in the Ukraine. Although he didn't anticipate the video getting this kind of attention and he had no designs on being famous, he was ecstatic that it got as popular as it did. 
One of the big mysteries of the video is how he remained quiet through the whole thing. You know, a glass jar just exploded in his ass and he's bleeding all over. Like, you've never seen a guy bleed like this before. You'd expect at least a little... Eh, but, but nothing. A big rumor was that he broke the glass on purpose and he didn't make a sound because it was feeling kind of good to him. But he assured Best Gore that this was a complete accident and it did not feel good. Usually what he would do was fill the jars up with water to keep them from breaking like this, but this time he didn't bother and he paid the price. There was also a rumor that he was so quiet because his family was in the other room and he didn't want them to hear. In the comments section of the article, he explained that his wife and two sons weren't home. He simply didn't make a sound because he didn't feel like it. In fact, he even went to work an hour later. That is the most Russian shit that I've ever heard in my life. But in any case, he's got a ton of blood pouring out of his glass-filled asshole. Now what? He said he felt like he was gonna pass out for a bit, but he didn't. And he attributed his resilience to his history of donating blood. What a stand-up guy. This means that if you've ever had a blood transfusion somewhere around the Ukraine, there's a chance that you're walking around carrying a little bit of the jar man with you. And he also took care of the situation entirely by himself. He didn't go to a doctor because he didn't want to explain what happened to a doctor. He just took out as much of the glass as he could, stuffed himself up with some cotton and went on life as usual and in about two weeks or so he was all healed up. And now with all that being said, the burning question is why? What would compel a man to take a glass jar and just stuff it up his ass? Alex explains, I decided to stretch my anus to the max many years ago. I wanted to be able to fist my own ass, which I eventually managed. The ability to stick your own fist up your rectum definitely offers a variety of sensations that you can't experience otherwise. I must admit that the beginning were rather tough. Until your anal opening is stretched well enough, trying to force large objects through there induces vomiting. As you continue doing it, you eventually get used to it and don't throw up anymore. Then it's pure pleasure. And it doesn't happen all at once. He explained that he started off with glass coke bottles and worked his way up to that 87mm monster in the video. That jar was his crowning achievement. The interview ends with a brief discussion about how Alex, when he was younger, thought about having a career in porn, but living in the former Soviet Union it wasn't a real possibility. Although now he was branching off into a few other sites. In particular, OwMyAss.com, which documented Alex cleaning up his bloody asshole the day after, and SexRazor.com, which documents Alex shoving his Bic Razor up his pee hole. Neither of these sites would reach the same acclaim as One Guy One Jar, but it was never about the fame for Alex. It was about the art. And that being said, he also shared two videos with Best Gore that, at that time, had not been seen by anybody else on the internet. One labeled Finger O2, and another labeled Tool O2. Although I don't know what Finger O2 is, I have an idea about what Tool O2 might be. Let's go back to IMDB. You know how Alex was credited on the IMDB page for One Guy One Jar? Well, you click on his name and he has another credit. One guy, one screwdriver. Another video that you're very likely to be familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it at this point, you probably have an idea from the name what it entails. With multiple famous videos like that under his belt, I think it's safe to say that Alex is the undisputed king of internet shock videos. And in fact, he actually has so many more. You see, if you were to look him up on Xtube, you would be greeted by an avatar of Alex recreating the famous Goatsy pose. And on his page, there's a veritable smorgasbord of different objects of different sizes getting shoved up different orifices. And it's funny how things come full circle. One of Alex's new fans would come to him with a warning. Please be careful with glass in your ass. You've never seen a video of a jar breaking in a guy's ass? Watch at your own risk. It's my video, pal. Anyway, that's the story of One Guy, One Cup. In 1995, a new piece of legislature was introduced by Republican Senator Slade Gordon and Democratic Senator James Exxon. This piece of legislature would eventually come to be known as the Communications Decency Act of 1996. This act was the very first attempt by the US government to regulate content on the internet. 
the law would penalize uploaders of sexually explicit, obscene, or most worrisome, indecent content. Critics believe that the nebulous nature of defining things as indecent would be an affront to the First Amendment. They also worried that content that was available legally offline would suddenly be made illegal when it was put online. If made into law, this act would essentially destroy the internet. It was passed by Congress on February 1st, 1996. And then a week later on February 8th, it was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. In protest of these new laws, a software engineer named Thomas E. Dell, under the pseudonym Soylent, created a little website known as Rotten.com. Although thanks to the efforts of the ACLU, the controversial portions of the Communications Decency Act were ruled unconstitutional, Rotten.com remained online for over 20 years as a middle finger to those who would try to censor the internet. This is the story of that website. <laughs> Several years back, I think in 1996 or 1997, I received an unsolicited email to my old AOL account. This email was advertising a website called Rotten.com, and not yet being the jaded internet user that I would eventually become, I clicked on it. And I'm glad I did, because that site blew my mind. In their own words, Rotten.com was the soft underbelly of the net, eviscerated for all to see. And in their view, they served as a bastion of free speech on the internet. According to their About page, Rotten.com is the internet's preeminent publisher of disturbing, offensive, disgusting, yet extremely compelling content. Founded in 1996 after the enactment of the Communications Decency Act, our mission is to actively demonstrate that censorship of the internet is impractical, unethical, and wrong. While the CDA was ruled unconstitutional in 1997, and similar laws have come and gone, we continue to serve as a haven for free speech of a most controversial nature. But as a kid, I didn't really care about any of that. I just wanted to see the pictures of gore, mangled bodies, strange diseases, stuff that I had previously only ever experienced cinematic, fictional approximations of. I was always a big fan of horror, but this wasn't horror, this was reality. And I've also always been curious about that email I received, because that email address is long gone at this point, but surely other people got it too. But when I asked on Twitter how you first discovered Rotten.com, I didn't receive a single response mentioning that email. The overwhelming majority of you, uh, despite it being a website for adults, heard about it at school from other kids. And in one case, one of your teachers. A lot of you also heard about it from relatives, in particular a lot of you found out about it from your mothers, which thinking about how it seems like older women loved their investigation discovery murder shows, I wonder if there's like something going on there. But the biggest source of traffic for Rotten.com back in those formative years was pictures of dead celebrities. A lot of people found their way to Rotten.com looking for pictures of Tupac, Chris Farley, Nicole Brown Simpson, and perhaps most infamously, Princess Diana. On September 12th, 1997, a few short weeks after Princess Diana's death in a car crash in France, Rotten published a graphic photo purporting to be a picture of Diana at the scene of the crash. Their links spread like wildfire and Rotten.com made the news. A group called Rotten, which dubs itself an archive of disturbing illustration, had added the photo to its website. It purports to show Diana post-accident. An inset that could be Diana's face appears in the bottom corner of the photo with the caption, Death of a Princess. It's unclear whether the woman in the car wreck is Diana and there is no credit line to the picture. While Rotten made a cursory attempt to analyze the possible authenticity of the photo, it didn't stop there. When at such time we receive better accident photos, they will appear at this spot immediately. If you have any, send them, it says on the site. A spokesman for Paris Criminal Police told Reuters today, This is not a picture of Princess Diana's accident. It's a fake. Rescuers in the picture were not wearing standard French emergency services gear, he added. Also, a three-digit emergency phone number in the background, 999, was not a French number and appeared to be British. Rotten.com responded by saying that they never claimed the photos were authentic. They also noted that since the coverage began, their traffic skyrocketed. We got swamped. For several months, we were receiving 25,000 visitors per day. After 3 million visitors, Rotten.com underwent a format change, and the number of visitors increased to about 35,000 per day. 
On September 17th, there were about 50,000 visitors. Yesterday, after the media attention on September 18th, we served 75,000 visitors. But prior to noon today, Rotten had received 50,000 visitors and the load average on the machine, a Swank 4 processor Spark, was 95. It's normally 1 100th of that. The pictures have been removed for the time being. They have not been censored, there is just not enough bandwidth for us to serve the demand. If you have a T3 and are willing to act as a mirror site to shoulder a bit of this, please let our staff know in order to make arrangements. And at this point, they were still only on their way to their peak as the destination site for content people dare not speak of. It also wouldn't be their only brush with hoaxes. In fact, like Faces of Death, the VHS movie that I would call the spiritual predecessor to Rotten.com, a lot of the content that people remember most vividly was actually fake. Rotten.com actually played a big part in propagating a lot of early internet trolling campaigns and outright hoaxes. And these campaigns often sent the authorities, the media, and legal departments spinning around in circles. A good example of this is the time Rotten.com made Trenchcoat.org. On April 20th of 1999, the Columbine High School massacre made history as the deadliest school shooting to date. Early on in the investigation, one of the perpetrator's parents claimed that his son was a member of something called the Trenchcoat Mafia. Although this wound up being a very minor point in the story, it was an easy digestible thing for the media to latch on and create some imagery with. It was also something that was the target of a lot of mockery on the much edgier 1999 internet. But the authorities weren't laughing. Shout out to my friend Pete who had the cops knock on the door because he put Trenchcoat Mafia in his AOL profile. It was at this time that the creator of Rotten.com made a website called Trenchcoat.org. This site, which positioned itself as the official site of the Trenchcoat Mafia, had content such as the Trenchcoat Mafia Manifesto, pictures of Neo from the Matrix in black and white, and at the bottom of the site, there is a link labeled Who to Sue that would send you to the purported owners of the website. When clicked, that link would send you to the website of... And the Burlington Code Factory was not pleased. Dear Sir or Madam, it has come to our attention that the above-referenced website, which is registered to Soylent Communications, has been using the name Burlington Coat Factory without the consent of Burlington Coat Factory Warehouse Corporation. The website contains a number of tasteless commentaries on the April 20th tragedy that occurred at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. Specifically, the website lists Burlington Coat Factory under the caption, Who to Sue, and provides a link to the company website of Burlington Coat Factory. This unauthorized use of our name and infringement on our trademark is defamatory, libelous, and actionable, and we demand that Soylent Communications immediately remove all references to Burlington Coat Factory from this website. Furthermore, we demand that Soylent Communications immediately provide Burlington Coat Factory with any and all information in its possession regarding any person or entity involved in the development or maintenance of www.trenchcoat.org. We are outraged by this malicious attempt to associate us with such a tragedy. We will not sit idly by and allow your website solutions to besmirch our company name and reputation. Be advised that if you do not immediately remove all references to Burlington Coat Factory from the website, we will pursue all legal and equitable remedies available to us. Soylent complied with their demands and changed Trenchcoat.org to a compilation of all the hate mail they had received. And it wasn't just the Burlington Coat Factory that would send them legal threats. In fact, they received so many that they eventually made an entire section just for the legal threats they received. Like the time Pillsbury threatened them over a picture of Doughboys being cooked alive. Or the time MasterCard threatened them over parodies of their ads. Or the time Coca-Cola threatened them over a picture of a Coke bottle shoved up someone's ass. All things that realistically should be covered under fair use, but at the same time were things that Soylent had to back down from because he couldn't afford a costly legal battle over single images. But that's not to say that Rotten.com was unwilling to take risks for their purported free speech values. Consider the case of Bonsai Kitten. 
Bonsai Kitten was a hoax website created by MIT students that purported to teach you how to grow a kitten into the shape of a jar. The website claimed that by placing a kitten into a jar, as it grew, its bones would take the shape of its container and you would eventually have a fancy shaped adult cat. And although to any reasonable person this would be an obvious hoax, obvious joke website, it fooled a lot of people. And the people it tricked were outraged and the outraged people managed to get the site taken down from its servers at least two times. Eventually, Rotten.com stepped up to the plate and allowed Bonsai Kitten to be hosted on their servers where it had its permanent home. This once again put Rotten.com at odds with the law, however, because eventually the FBI started investigating Bonsai Kitten. But thankfully, the FBI too eventually realized that this was a fake joke website, and Bonsai Kitten continues to fool idiots on the internet to this very day. And Rotten would eventually find itself at the center of free speech controversies once again when a new law was proposed known as the Child Online Protection Act, or COPA. After parts of the Communications Decency Act, the very law that inspired Rotten.com's creation were found to be unconstitutional, COPA was made as a way to try to circumvent those rulings and basically try again. This time, the law would restrict access to content deemed harmful to minors based on contemporary community standards. During the COPA hearings, Donna Rice Hughes, the CEO of a company called Enough is Enough, an organization whose sole purpose is to censor the internet because think of the children, directly mentioned Rotten.com as a reason why this law was needed. Once again, this law was initially approved. It wasn't until later on that the Court of Appeals found that contemporary community standards was too broad of a definition. And like the CDA, it was also ruled that COPA was unconstitutional, saving the internet from this sort of fuckery one more time. Of course, not everyone around the world was so lucky. Around the time that COPA was deemed unconstitutional in the US, similar laws were passed in Germany. And as a result of this law, 56 different ISPs had to block access to Rotten.com. Although Rotten.com and its owner Soylent fought the good fight for free speech online for over 20 years, as of 2017, Rotten.com is down. However, according to an interview with TheOutline.com, Soylent said that the site's not gone, he's simply having some hardware issues. Although it's not back yet, he said it will eventually return. But the battle for free speech on the internet continues without Rotten.com, perhaps stronger than ever before. Think of the Children has taken on so many new forms, and the gatekeepers of old have lost their power, and they're trying to get it back. In these times, I think something Soylent said in an old interview at Salon.com really highlights the futility of trying to censor the internet. To censor this site, it is necessary to censor medical texts, history texts, evidence rooms, courtrooms, art museums, libraries, and other sources of information vital to the functioning of a free society. Horrors are sprinkled throughout life, and I see no problem with concentrating them. If you want, we could go down to the bookstores and find pictures of cadavers for you. It's very easy. It's not possible to write a law to make it impossible to display that stuff, even for minors. It's too much of a slippery slope to take. It's March 1st of 2013. You wake up in your dorm room at Florida State University's Panama City campus, and at first, it's like any other day in 2013. You're taking a much needed break from YOLOing, so you send your friend a Harlem Shake video while remarking that it's so laughter. Much wow. Then all of a sudden, it happens. An ancient terror rises from the seas of the years gone by. A familiar sound can be heard echoing throughout the hallways. You can't quite make it out, but little by little it becomes louder and clearer. You spin me round by dead or alive. Good song, but what's happening? You look back at your 2013 gamer PC, click on your friend's response when you see it. Big floppy ding dong. Spinning in a clockwise motion as its owner gets pounded from underneath repeatedly, over and over again for all eternity. By 2013, and it had been years since this website had first reared its face, but so many years later, its memory had still not yet been erased. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of Meat Spin. It seems that a lot of you guys' favorite kind of video that I make is about those single surfing shock sites like Two Girls One Cup, Goatsy, One Guy One Jar. 
And one that gets requested a lot is Meat Spin, the website with a dick spinging in a clock. Did I say spinging? The one with a dick spinning in a circular motion while its owner gets fucked up the ass. And it has a counter that goes up every time you watch it repeat. And Meat Spin is a little bit different from a lot of these other shock sites in that it had a lot of different forms from the one you probably know. Spin.gif, the original spinning dick gif, is purported to have originated on the site clerk.org, a site that at first appeared to parody the layout of Goatsy while mirroring a lot of other popular shock sites, and eventually pictures of the owner's food. And in April of 2004, it would make its way to dickcream.com. So, dickcream.com, if you watched my video about the history of YTMND, you'll remember that I mentioned that its owner, Max Goldberg, at that period in time, liked to register a lot of different wacky, funny URLs. And after his friend Sean suggested it, he registered dickcream.com. Unfortunately, Sean passed away in early 2004, and this caused Max to think, hey, we have to do something with this URL. But he wasn't sure what to actually do with the website, so he gifted it to his other friend, Sode. Sode had some ideas about what to do with it. Max, I'll give you access to a domain. I don't have anything for dickcream.com. Sode, sweet. I'll just keep making lame flash loops and animated GIFs. They're so rawful-rific. And some have called this website the spiritual predecessor to YTMND. Very little has been archived of dickcream.com because most of the site was in Flash. But some YTMND users did try to recreate things that they saw on dickcream.com, like the site made by Curdy V. And later that month, Spin.gif would get one of its first bursts of mainstream popularity on YTMND. In fact, this image was featured on the seventh ever YTMND made, entitled Raiden Spinners. On the site, they used the song Raiden Spinners by 3-6 Mafia, which itself was about spinning rims and featured them prominently in the music video. It also displayed the text we write in spin as also Cox. And it's debated whether or not it always said also Cox. Personally, I remember also Cox always being there. But either way, the, just the phrase also Cox became a meme in itself, getting repeated across the internet with and without the same context. It would also lead to a few safer work variants, like Tetris is right in spinners, Teddy Bears is right in spinners, and Pee Wee is right in spinners. And it was March of 2005, almost a full year later, that Meatspin.com was created. And this was where it would gain most of its popularity as a site that you trick people into looking at. Now with the song you spin me around by Dead or Alive and the counter that goes up every time you see it spin. That number goes higher than 45, you get a pop-up that says, You are now officially gay, smiley face. It's hard to say for sure who the proud owner of the Meatspin world record is, but according to Meatspin.cc, a mirror site for Meatspin, it belongs to a few Irishmen. The world Meatspin record is... 10,112,000 spins. Legend states that the record for spins viewed is held by a group of Irish university students in 2009 who recorded themselves sitting through a total of 10,112,000 spins. It is believed that the team comprised of four students working around the clock to ensure they did not miss any spins. Although video evidence was taken on a webcam, the recording was lost. The story has not been verified with evidence. So you got 10,112 spins divided by 45, that's about 222,224. They divide by 4 for each student, and each of them is about 55,506 times gay. The numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for you as sacrifice! And it became really common with this site in particular to set people's homepages to it when they weren't looking, to do it at your school, or to go to Best Buy or something and make all the computers have their homepage be meat spin. And there are a few other variants of the site that popped up, one of them where it had like a little window that popped up and it's bouncing around the screen, like that DVD logo when you're trying to click it and more to come up. And there was another version I remembered where it made it look like your computer had a virus and then it's like it's doing the bar where it fills up as it does a virus scan on your computer then all of a sudden you're staring at the little bar go up and boom it's meat spin right in your face. At some point a few people got scared that meat spin contained a virus and I can't help but think that that theory originates from that version of the site. But here's an example of someone who got scared by it on Yahoo Answers. Is meat spin a virus? My friend told me to check it out and, hell no ain't, I don't know WTF meat spin is. 
Aaron C says, It gay, literally. Don't go unless you like guys. No, it's not a virus. It's just two guys having butt sex. Source experience, I got tricked. And in fact, the identity of one of the people featured in the Meatspin video was revealed on the Meatspin.com forums, and yes, there were Meatspin.com forums. Most of the posts on the forums went as you might imagine. You're being shut down. I am reporting you to IPS and your site is being shut down. You may find yourself in court. But in one thread asking about where the clip originated from, it was said that it originated from a Brazilian film entitled T.S. Bitches and starred trans porn star Cristina Bianchini aka Cristina Bianca. As time went on, Meatspin, like a lot of other shock sites, came and went, faded away to the darkest places of our memory. But the site would have one last hurrah in 2013. It was that year, on March 1st, that Florida State University's Panama campus would endure an attack against its wireless network. An attack that caused all the traffic on the network to redirect to Meatspin.com for a whole 30 minutes. That's a lot of spins. The hacker was very quickly identified as a computer engineering student named Patrick Blowen. Probably not how his name is actually pronounced, but it's how I choose to pronounce his name. Patrick Blowen was subsequently suspended and arrested and charged with felony offenses against computer users. A protected class, I believe. Patrick maintained that he didn't specifically choose Meatspin to be the target site, but rather that it was chosen at random by his hacking app. He also claimed that he did this because he was concerned about the network security and doing this would force the university to fix it. Something that they did extremely quickly. What can I say? I guess not all heroes wear capes. In the time since, Meatspin has expired and changed hands many times throughout the years. Sometimes it's porn sites trying to harvest ad revenue, and sometimes it's hub sites that are like, Hey guys, prank your enemies with epic shock sites! But can you actually believe that they managed to gentrify Meatspin. Did you ever imagine that in your life you'd be looking back fondly on a big swinging dick and think, ah yes, better times? Once upon a time in 12th century England, there lived a man named Roland. Roland, a court jester, was one of the most beloved subjects of King Henry II. So much so that he was given 30 acres of land and ownership of Hemingstone Manor. What made Roland so special? Well, you see, once every year on Christmas, Roland, more popularly known as Roland the Farter, would come fart for the king. <laughs> Flash forward to the year 2008. This was the year that we all became kings, when medieval pleasures were brought to our bedrooms at the push of a button. No need to wait for Christmas. This was the year when our homes became the court to perhaps the most famous fart performance in all of human history. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of CakeFarts.com. I'm gonna be totally honest, the intro to this video had very little to do with the actual story I'm about to cover. I just thought it was kinda of funny that there is a guy who existed in the world with the name Roland the Farter. Although Roland and the star of Cake Farts do have the common ground of being professional farters, one was more for humor and one was more for pleasure. Although of course, in practice, those lines got blurred. The story of Cake Farts begins on July 17th of 2008, when a post was made on the Something Awful forums. A user named Owl of Cream Cheese wrote, You know what I liked the most? Cake Farts. Which contained the YouTube link to THE infamous Cake Farts video. I'm sure this will get taken down soon, but holy crap this is the weirdest fetish I have ever seen. I could never have imagined anyone would have the fetish of farting into cakes. Funny it stayed on YouTube so long. I would love to see Cake Farts survive in today's climate. But if you've actually never seen Cake Farts, allow me to show you what I can and describe the rest to you. It begins with a simple shot on a very plain chocolate cake, on a countertop in an unassuming suburban kitchen. A woman then appears on screen to tell us, You know what I like the most? Cake Farts. She then tastes a small bit of the cake as the camera zooms out to reveal that she's not wearing any pants. She then walks around the counter, climbs up on top of it, gets, as she describes it, comfortable, then proceeds to lower herself onto the cake. The following is the audio of the farts. Oh, yeah. 
For that particular fart, you can hear it was a very special fart. You could see her asshole puff out like those guys from Airman Stage on Mega Man 2. That right there, that's what the asshole looks like. And she's not done yet. Roll it. At the end of the video, it looks like she's squatting down, charging up for one last big fart, but it doesn't come. She then gets down on one knee and looks back at her asshole in a state of confusion. And that's where the video ends. Some forum users were unimpressed, while for some others it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. But one thing was absolutely crystal clear. This video was not going to last on YouTube. Not even in 2008. It needed to be preserved, and more importantly, shared with the rest of the world. Thus, frequent Something Awful contributor Chris P.D. Peterson did what he had to do and created CakeFarts.com. Under the name The Enigmatic Cake Lord, he created the world's top destination for that specific video, and also its eventual sister site, Pudding Farts. And understand now that at this point, we're already living in a post goat sea, post two girls, one cup, post pain Olympics world. Cake Farts is far from shocking for this sort of single serving site. Cake Farts fell into kind of a new space for this kind of website, not spreading for how shocking it was, but more so just for how absurd the idea was. As just a funny fucking video, I mean, she looks at her ass confused. So, of course, you've seen these kinds of videos from me before, you know where this goes at this point. Millions of people are sharing the site, so it gets bombarded with traffic, and it becomes a struggle to maintain the website. Reaction videos sprout up on YouTube. She's kind of ugly. She looks pretty trashy. And with Cake Farts being a bit more accessible than other videos of its type, you also get some people imitating it. Perhaps most famously, Zoe Zane going on the Howard Stern show to fart on a cake for him. You can't really do that with Two Girls, One Cup or the BME Pain Olympics. I mean, you can, but who would? And while all this is going down, the creator of this website, Chris Peterson, finds himself falling further and further down the cake farts rabbit hole. In an article written in September of 2008, barely two months after the original site went up, he wrote an article on SomethingAwful.com about how the site had begun to affect his life. Chris quickly learned that the Cake For It's video was not a unique standalone piece of art, but rather a gateway into another dimension. Worlds previously unknown. Meanwhile, my inbox flooded. There were cake farting enthusiasts inviting me to their forums. There were fart porn actresses begging me to advertise their wares. Short, downloadable movies with titles like Public Fart Diaries, The Donut Shop 1, and Public Fart Diaries, The Donut Shop 2. I wanted to ask the director what vision he had about farting at the donut shop that wasn't adequately addressed in the first volume, but didn't dare. And shortly after this, he would be contacted by a man that he would come to refer as Cake Fartin' Steve. No relation to Wild Steve, at least I don't think. You see, while Chris found himself inundated with messages from all caliber of fart enthusiasts, Cake Fartin' Steve was special. Steve was the great granddaddy of Cake Fart fans. When the prehistoric fish came out of the ocean and started walking, Steve was that thing for cake farting. This message from Steve was his big reveal. If you need more content, I got it for you. A couple of years ago, I was at a forum, Queen of Farts, and I started posting scripts about women farting on cakes to see people's reaction. I was expecting to see what women would say, but to my surprise, a couple of young sexy women, Ashley, the one in your video, and Mandy started farting on cakes. I was so turned on, it was unreal, like a dream come true. I ordered that video you posted, by the way, one of my favorites. Cake Farting Steve was the man who manifested this video into existence. He had commissioned porn actress Ashley Asuka, who was around the Queen of Farts forums. Her credits included some Spice Channel appearances. Busting Bull Balls Barefoot, and Filthy Frank's Real Amateur. Not that filthy Frank, at least I don't think so, but an even filthier Frank. And at the time Ashley and Cake Fart and Steve crossed paths, she had been actively seeking commissions. Basically, they met at the right place, right time, and Cake Farts was born. Chris had to know more. Why? What drives a man to have such a specific interest as women farting on cakes? Cake Farting Steve replied with probably the most in-depth explanation of this fetish ever written before, and that probably ever will be written. 
It makes me aroused thinking that a woman can not only fart in public, which is considered taboo, and not only in the sexual sense, which is considered for most people like night and day, but also farting is usually not associated with being an adult. In this context, a woman will willfully release her gas on food items, which is the ultimate taboo as bodily fluids and food are further apart as we're being educated since potty training age to abstain from mixing it up. Now to trace it back, I think it dates back to circa 1990. I was at a motel room in Florida when I came across an aging 50 plus actress sitting stark naked on a bed in Vogue Mag. She looked gorgeous. Yes, I do find some mature women really attractive. My mind started wandering and I was imagining her assistant pulling a prank on her by sneaking behind her with a cake, unbeknownst to her. She happened to need to fart, so naturally, not knowing of the presence of her assistant pulling tricks on her, she lets it go all over the cake, assuming she was alone and no one would notice. Of course, she didn't know about the cake. I really didn't know what made it so erotic. Perhaps the voyeuristic and naughty nature of it, the assistant watching her naked, the prank, her being a sexy older actress, I was 18 at the time. God knows what. I was in sexual Neverland. Ever since then, I had a fixation pertaining to women breaking winds on cakes. The best part is the fantasize about smashing it in a slave's face and making him eat the fart infested cake afterwards. Sort of a BDSM-ish twist to it, huh? I'm not a shrink, but I bet Freud would have something to say about cake farting. And the next series of messages is where Chris starts to fly a bit too close to the sun. He starts to come at Cake Fart and Steve with hypotheticals about what will and won't work. A scenario in which a woman is shopping in a cake shop and she's trying to hold in her farts, but at some point she just can't hold it in anymore and engulfs the entire cake store in a big fart cloud. Midgets jumping on a woman's belly to force the farts out of her. The scene from Peter Pan where Smee farts. Being held down and forcibly farted on by a dominatrix. Steve enjoyed the store scenario, but he wasn't much a fan of the dominatrix one. And at this point, Cake Farting Steve started to ask more questions about Chris, which Chris was not on board with, understandably so. So Chris tries to deflect by asking more questions. Do you sniff seats? Do you scratch the seats and hold it up to your nose? And what do your nostrils do when you do that? As Chris puts it, farting is the window to a man's soul, as de Tocqueville said. And I want to peer into yours and put on a diving suit and wander, flippering through your acrid dreams. But it was the last line of his email that probably sealed the deal of their relationship. Oh, and also, I hope you asphyxiate on your own farts one night with tears streaming from your irritated eyes and that your last thought is the strained revelation that you are human garbage. Damn, that's actually kinda mean, especially after Cake Fart and Steve brought so much joy into the world with that video. And judging by his response, Steve had been pushed past his limit. What the hell, man? Jesus, you sound like Freud, lol. Are you a man or a woman? I'm not that desperate. I don't sniff farts at all in public. I just fantasize about women farting on food, among other things, to get off. Tell me more about yourself. I just watched Ashley's meatball farts. Pretty sexy girl, ain't she? The only way I would tolerate your abuse is if you're a dominatrix woman. If you are, then I will smell your farts. If not, you know where to go. Common, man. I was joking. I like to smell women farts. You're pathetic. That would be the last time the enigmatic Cake Lord would hear from Cake Fart and Steve. However, a few days later, he would receive an email from the FBI issuing a DMCA takedown notice. FBI, cease and desist order immediately. Take down Cake Farts or bear the consequences. I am an undercover agent from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, Computer Crimes Unit. I was assigned to investigate whether you were violating the Digital Millennium Copyright Act 1998. I was contacted by the girl in the video who claims you had no permission to use her video in your commercial website. As a result, there is an outstanding cease and desist order against you. Whereas you had admitted to me that you are indeed the operator of www.cakefarts.com and I possess the entire transcripts of our email conversations, we actually have established your identity. Should you continue running your website in violation of DMCA Act, you will hereby be prosecuted and the host company be fined. You are warned. Now, I might be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure this is not what the FBI does. It's probably 
some ambulance chasing lawyer you gotta depend on for the DMCA takedown, no? So either Cake Fart and Steve was glowing this whole time, or he's, he might be lying. Chris decided to call the FBI's bluff by responding that impersonating a federal agent is a crime punishable by up to three years in prison. And that was the last he ever heard from either Cake Farting Steve or the FBI. Although this correspondence ended on a sour note, I can't help but think Cake Fart and Steve took great joy in knowing how far his video had spread, and how many new Cake Farting videos were created due to his influence. In a way, it's as if for a period of time, we were all just living inside of Cake Fart and Steve's ass cloud. Bonsai is the ancient Japanese art of growing miniature trees by keeping them in containers that restrict their growth. Although the art of bonsai is often admired for its incredible aesthetics and its connection to Buddhist tradition, there are those who are troubled by the ethics of stunting the growth of a tree. Growing bonsai is cruel. You stunt their growth. Don't allow the roots to grow. Bind their branches with wire, like the feet of Japanese ladies. Okay, cruel? Well, if there's people out there who think bonsai trees are cruel, wait till they find out about the bonsai kittens. Bonsai Kitten represents an important moment in internet history, both as one of the fastest spreading memes of the pre-social media era, and as one of the first internet hoaxes that got way, way bigger than its creators ever expected. It begins on December 20th of 2000, when it was uploaded by a man going by the name Dr. Michael Wong. The intro page describes the guiding principles of Bonsai Kitten. For centuries, people in the West have marveled at the delicate beauty produced by Oriental artists and sculptors. From gardening, to tattooing, to dance and martial arts, these craftsmen have enthralled us with complex forms and simplistic perfection. One of the most fascinating of the visual techniques to emerge from this highly cultured region is the Oriental art of miniature sculpture. Who has not been stricken with the expressive grace of Japanese bonsai? Though once the sole province of bonsai masters within Japan, bonsai plants have been available to fortunate consumers throughout the world for some time. With this in mind, we are proud to now offer to you the animal complement of this art form, the bonsai kitten. Central Principles A bonsai plant, along with its more widely encountered counterpart, the topiary garden, achieves its miniature yet mature form through a long and delicate process of trimming during the formative years of the tree. It is not possible to trim a kitten. However, fortunately, the oriental artists of yore were also expert in the modification of animal forms. Both foot binding and head binding were practiced in the Far East for the purpose of miniaturizing the feet and shaping the head into attractive shapes. This technique is also the principle behind the well-known corset, which is regaining popularity in recent years. By physically constraining the growth of a developing living thing, it can be directed to take the shape of the vessel that constrains it. Just as a topiary gardener produces bushes that take the forms of animals or any other thing, you no longer need be satisfied with a house pet having the same mundane shape as all other members of its species. With Bonsai Kitten, a world of variation awaits you, limited only by your own imagination. It then gives you the process about how you can make your very own Bonsai Kitten. Method. At only a few weeks of age, a kitten's bones have not yet hardened and become osseous. They are extremely soft and springy. In fact, if you take a weak old kitten and throw it to the floor, it will actually bounce. We do not recommend that you try this at home. The kitten may bounce under the furniture and be difficult to retrieve, as well as covered in unsightly household dust. However, the flexibility of the kitten's skeleton means that if the bones are gently warped at this early age, they could be molded into any desired shape. At Bonsai Kitten, we achieve this by placing the kitten into a rigid vessel soon after birth and allowing the young cat to grow out its formative time entirely within this container. The kitten essentially grows into the shape of the vessel. Once the cat is fully developed, it is removed, or the vessel broken to remove it, producing the lovable furry pet you've always wanted, but it remains in the shape you've always dreamed of. There is virtually no limit to the eventual shape of your pet. This process, of course, would not actually work. Uh, the cat would 
very quickly die before it became any kind of square or jar shape or anything like that. But of course, this is the internet so that didn't stop people from falling for it, and what really sealed the deal was the gallery of 100% really real images of real bonsai kittens. And this site spread extremely quickly in a very short amount of time, primarily because two days later, on December 22nd, it was featured as Cruel.com's Cruel Site of the Day. Once it hit that site, the traffic to Bonsai Kitten exploded, and also, you know, despite the fact that Cruel.com is named Cruel.com and its feature was the Cruel Site of the Day, it was just a bit too much for their viewers and they started to get a ton of backlash. It doesn't matter that the site was obviously fake as fuck to anyone with two brain cells to rub together, they caved to the pressure and removed it. But the site itself remained up, causing more outcry, and eventually the Humane Society of America got involved. In response to the many complaints we received, the HSUS investigated the origin of the site. We found that the original host of the site was the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and that the name and address under which the site is registered, a Dr. Michael Wong in New York, is false information. The site was reportedly created by a student at MIT as a joke among friends. Encouraged by all the negative attention, the student cited his right to free speech in an attempt to keep the site up and running. MIT was supportive of the concerns of animal organizations and citizens who complained about the site and cooperated to the fullest extent allowed by the law in removing the site, which they did on December 22nd. Shortly after its removal from MIT's servers, however, Bonsai Kitten would quickly return on another web host. And a bunch of people still convinced that Bonsai Kitten was real started an email campaign. To anyone with love and respect for life, in New York, there is a Japanese who sells bonsai kittens. Sounds like fun, huh? Not. These animals are squeezed into a bottle. Their urine and feces are removed through probes. They feed them with a kind of tube. They feed them chemicals to keep their bones soft and flexible, so the kittens grow into the shape of the bottle. The animals will stay there as long as they live. They can't walk or move or wash themselves. Bonsai kittens are becoming a fashion in New York and Asia. See this horror at bonsaikitten.com. Please sign this email in protest against these tortures. If you receive an email with over 500 names, please send a copy to anacheka at hotmail.com. From there, this protest will be sent to USA and Mexican animal protection organizations. And as the email campaign grew, the Humane Society would once again jump into action. In mid-January, we began receiving complaints about the site resurfacing, and we learned that the site's new host was not MIT, but a company called Web2010.com. We contacted this company to voice our concerns, and the company immediately removed the site on January 17th. After this removal, it would be Soylent, the owner of Rotten.com, who would take Bonsai Kitten and allow them to be hosted on Rotten servers. They would continue to receive tons of backlash, but Soylent, as the guy who ran Rotten.com, really didn't give a shit. Uh, this was child's play to him. Although they did up the ante a bit when the FBI got involved. FBI goes after BonsaiKitten.com. Here's what you do. Stuff a kitten into a jar and shape it into a beautiful. Of course it's a joke, but not everybody is laughing, and that includes the FBI. Declan McCullough reports from Washington, D.C. FBI agents in the Boston field office have launched an investigation into the site. They also have served MIT with a grand jury subpoena asking for any and all subscriber information about the site, which was initially hosted in a campus dormitory but has since moved to a commercial provider. And when Wired asked him what he thought about this investigation, one of the site's creators responded, I was surprised, Chang said. I really thought that the FBI had better things to do. That's your tax dollars at work. And during this investigation, the Massachusetts SPCA deployed their special police, because apparently that's something they have. A gun-toting investigator from the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals reportedly stopped by campus and quizzed MIT network administrators about the intent of the site. Under state law, MSPCA investigators are deputized as special state police officers with investigation and arrest abilities. And at this point, it was pretty commonly known that Bonsai Kitten was a parody website and that even if someone tried to really do this, it wouldn't work. 
But then, of course, as these things do, the argument shifted away from their showing animal cruelty to they might inspire animal cruelty. And then when we get there, we start to wade into the waters of the free speech debate. Why are they doing this? Asks Harvey Silverglate, a prominent Boston criminal defense attorney. I think the answer is that political correctness has infected the FBI. The kind of fanatical end of the spectrum animal protection movement has affected them, says Silverglate, a partner at Silverglate and Good. They want to be the good guys. They massively run rampant over Americans' liberties, but they want to be seen as nice fuzzy guys who want to protect kittens. And ultimately, what people were hoping to do with Bonsai Kitten were use a law that was signed by Bill Clinton in 1999. In December 1999, President Clinton signed a law that makes it a federal felony to possess a depiction of animal cruelty with the intent to distribute across state lines, such as on the internet. During a floor debate, Representative Elton Gallagher claim that sick criminals are taking advantage of the loopholes in the local law and the lack of federal law on animal cruelty videos. Thankfully, whether it be because of free speech concerns, uh, difficulties implementing this law, or maybe the FBI just realized how ridiculous this was, nobody wound up getting prosecuted for Bonsai Kitten. The site would stay online until 2016, with a brief period in 2012 where it would direct to Think Geek's Bonsai Kitten plushies. And to this day, although the official site is now gone, it still is available through several mirrors, and it's still, although not as commonly, tricks a few dopes into thinking it's real. In fact, let's try something. Think of the most gullible person you know, and try to convince them that Bonsai Kitten is a real thing, and come back and report your results to me. Aside from merely being a host to a picture of a giant gaping asshole, Goatsy.cx also served the purpose of being a hub to other fringe websites at times. One such website was a website a lot of you have asked me to cover in the past, one dolphinsex.org. Obviously, judging by the name of that website, you should know that this video was intended for only people 18 or older, so no, if you're not, go fuck off. By now, I think the idea of humans fucking dolphins and dolphins getting sexually aggressive towards humans is somewhat common knowledge. You have that episode of King of the Hill everyone remembers where Hank gets molested by a dolphin in front of everybody. And then you have who's probably the most famous zoophile in history, Malcolm Brenner, who wrote the book Wet Goddess which I guess I'll put in my Amazon store if you're interested in that, about his relationship with a dolphin. And he would also have a documentary made about him. The first time I ever heard of this whole thing being a phenomenon was when it came across DolphinSex.org thanks to Goatsy. After they posted it, as well as I believe Rotten.com, it just exploded in popularity online. So let's take a look at the contents of this website. Wait a second, I know that guy. Sex Guide. Dolphins. FAQ on meeting by Dragon Wolf Dolphin. You know, this didn't really register to me back in the day, but I've noticed these kinds of people always seem to name themselves after the kind of animal they want to fuck. hey -o. Firstly, introductions all around. My name is Dragon Wolf Dolphin, musician. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any of his music, but I'm sure it's fantastic. Pre-vet student and Delphinic zoophile. People are often wondering just what the hell zoophilia is. Zoophilia is best described as a love of animals so intimate that the person and the animal involved have no objections to expressing their affection for each other in the sexual fashion. This is not to be confused with bestiality where a person forcefully mates with an animal without their consent, with no mutual feelings whatsoever. This is something that I would never do to a dolphin since I love them dearly and treat them with the same respect than an honest husband would for his wife and children. And this is a point of contention these people always seem to come back to this idea that the animal can consent to them, especially with dolphins who are admittedly uh, one of the more intelligent animals. Dolphins are very intelligent, highly emotional, expressive creatures. They enjoy the company of humans, and if a relationship develops between a human and a dolphin, as has happened with me, they will, on occasion, 
wish to express their trust and affection for you in the most direct way, through mating, or sex play. You see, dolphins do not use sex purely for procreative reasons. They use it as a way of strengthening the bonds between pod mates, mothers and calves included, and also for fun. Dolphins and humans share this common trait with very few other animals, so sometimes it makes me wonder when people continue to ask me, how do you mate with a dolphin? Easy, let the dolphin tell you. Well, here is a selection of questions people have asked me, so I hope this sheds some light on the subject. Question 1. How do I tell a male dolphin from a female one? Because, you know, fucking dolphins is one thing, but fucking a guy dolphin, ugh, that, that's gay. Yucky. Probably the most common question I get asked. There are two ways of determining the sex of a dolphin. The most obvious way is to take a peek under the peduncle, the long part of the body connected to the tail flukes. On the dolphin's belly, directly opposite the dorsal fin, will be the umbilicus, or the navel of the dolphin. Looking further down towards the tail, you start to see the differences. Male dolphins have two separate slits for the penis, the urogenital opening, and the anus. These are separated by a bridge of skin. The male's urogenital opening is generally located further up the belly, towards the navel. Females on the other fin... Ugh. You see, it was this witty writing style that I think back in the day made a lot of people question whether or not this was satirical or not, but... I guess knowing what we know now about the relationships between online people and dolphins, I, uh, it, it's a 50-50 shot whether or not this guy was dead ass. Females on the other fin have one continuous larger slit, the anus located at the end of it. On either side of the genital slit you will find two smaller slits. These are the mammary slits, where the nipples of the dolphin are kept for feeding the calves. The slit is also located closer to the tail stock of the dolphin. You know, the idea that dolphins are mammals, that's a trivia fact that I've always known about, but I never considered the question then, if dolphins are mammals, then what does a dolphin nipple look like? Let's find out. I was expecting some kind of big dolphin titty, what the fuck is this? The other way to determine the sex of a dolphin, if you can't reach their belly, is to look at their melon, or a head. The male tends to have a fatter, rounder melon, while the females are more sleek and streamlined. Question 2. How do I know if a dolphin wants to have sex? There are various ways a dolphin has of showing that she or he is interested in sex. Males are probably the easiest to detect. They will swim around sporting an erection anywhere between 10 to 14 inches long for a bottlenose and will have no bones. This guy, about swimming up to you and placing their member within reach of your hand. If you're in the water, they may rub it along any part of your body or wrap it around your wrist or ankle. Dolphin males have a prehensile penis. They can wrap it around the objects and carry them as such. Their belly will be pinkish in color, which also denotes sexual excitement. Okay, the writers of King of the Hill definitely saw this sight. Females can be a little harder. The most obvious way a female dolphin has of displaying her sexual interest is the pink belly effect. Their genitals become very pink and swollen, making the genital region very prominent. They may be restless or they may be acting as normal. If you are out of the water, they may swim up to you and roll belly up, exposing themselves to you, coupled with pelvic thrusts. If you are in the water, they may press their genitals up against yours, nibble your fingers, nuzzle your crotch, or do pelvic thrusts against you. Each dolphin's way of expressing sexual readiness varies, so the longer you know the dolphin, the better you will detect when they are sexually active. Question 3. What do I do if a dolphin wants to mate with me? Except, if possible, I will go through the steps involved with the males and females. The male. When a male dolphin is interested in you, about the only thing you can do if you are male is to masturbate him. Unfortunately, I cannot speak for the female of the human species. It seems women just don't like dolphins enough, so I cannot say for sure if it is safe to mate with them. I would suspect not due to a dolphin size, but then again, I cannot say for a woman. Honestly, I think the odds are good that there is a woman out there who has tried this. In fact, I kind of feel like I've read a story like that. Let me look this up right now. Sure, just type woman sex with dolphin right into fucking Google, right? 
woman who had sex with dolphin during lab experiments speaks out for first time. Margaret Howe Lovat tried to teach Peter the Dolphin how to speak English, but their relationship progressed to a whole new level. Apparently, though, according to the article, she didn't actually take the whole 15-inch dolphin dick, though. She just, you know, gave him a little tug and let him go off. Apparently what wound up being more controversial in this experiment was the fact that they were testing out LSD on dolphins. Anyway, let's continue with the original website. Warning, in the considerations of safety, you should never let a male dolphin attempt anal sex with you. The bottlenose dolphin member is around 12 inches, very muscular, and the thrusting and the force of ejaculation, a male can come as far as 14 feet, would cause serious internal injuries, resulting in peritonitis and possible death. Unless you are the masochistic type, you will have a hard time explaining your predicament to the doctors in the emergency ward. A male dolphin's member is roughly S-shaped, tapered at the end. If you are in the water with them, it is best to support the dolphins on his side, just under water, with one hand and handle him with the other. Male dolphins, I find, tend to prefer the base of the penis to be gently massaged and squeezed, as well as gently rubbed along its length. It feels very much like the rest of the dolphin, i.e. smooth and rubbery to the touch, but firmer. It doesn't take long for the male to ejaculate, around 40 seconds to a minute, and this is usually accompanied by either shuddering just prior to ejaculating, and thrusting and tail arching during ejaculation. The force of ejaculation can be powerful at times, so it is best to keep your face out of the line of fire, or keep his member underwater. You can attempt to lick and suck the end of it while masturbating as well, but be warned, do not try to give it full throat, and get the hell out of the way before he ejaculates. A male dolphin could snap your neck in an accidental thrust, and that would be the end of that relationship. The female. Well, the females are again a little trickier. There are two courses of action with a female fin, masturbation or mating. Masturbation. Female dolphins, once they show interest in you, can be supported in much the same way as the male, one hand under the fin, supporting her, the other doing the stimulating. The clitoris of the female is located at the top of the genital slit, and this is a prominent lump when erect. You can rub this with your fingertips or lick and suck it, but with the oral aspect you might end up with a bruised nose as they thrust into you. You can slide your hand gently into their genital opening and feel around inside, rubbing gently. They feel warm and muscular inside, their labia like tough, squishy sponge when they are excited. Don't be surprised if they start to play with your hand inside them. They have very manipulative muscles and can use them to carry and manipulate objects, including your hand. They can do things that will make a regular human woman turn green with envy. Damn, you ladies gotta step your keel game up. Their climax is coupled with stiffening, shuddering, sometimes a lot of thrusting, clinching of the vaginal muscles, and sometimes vocalization. Mating. This is harder. Obviously being human is awkward, but not impossible to mate in open water. It is easier to have the dolphin in a shallow area, like the shallows just off the beach, around one and a half to two feet deep. This is usually comfortable enough for both the dolphin and you. Gently, you should roll the dolphin on her side so she is lying belly towards you. You could prop yourself up on an elbow and lie belly to belly against her. You may want to use the other arm to gently hold her close and place the tip of your member against her genital slit. She will, if interested, arch her body up against you, taking you inside her body. There is usually a fair bit of wriggling and shifting, usually to get comfortable both outside and inside. Once comfortable though, females initiate a series of muscular vaginal contractions that rub the entire length of your member. They may also thrust rhythmically against you, so enjoy the experience while you can, since you will rarely last longer than a minute or two. Just prior to her climaxing, she will thrust up the speed of her contractions and thrusts. It is interesting to note that the times I have mated with females, they have timed their orgasms to mine. Whether they do this consciously or not, I do not know, but it is a great feeling to have two bodies shuddering against each other at the one time. And this part's, I guess it's kind of interesting, because of one half, the amount of detail he goes into like the elbow positioning and things like that makes you think that maybe this is a guy who's actually done things like this, but at the same time, with all the warnings he's given about the power of these creatures and whatnot, I'd be scared of getting my dick ripped clean the fuck off. It seems like something that's well in the realm of possibility here. One thing to note, 
Whether you masturbate or mate a fin, male or female, always spend time with them afterwards. Cuddle them, rub them, talk to them, and most importantly, show them you love them. This is essential, as it helps to strengthen the bond between you. Like a way of saying this wasn't just a one-night fling. The dolphins appreciate it, and they will want your company more the next time you visit them. Honestly, there's probably human women watching this that wish they were treated as well as the fucking dolphins in this story. But just because you've successfully fucked the dolphin, that doesn't mean that your concerns should end here. What diseases can I get from dolphins? Can I give them any? I have no experiences with sexually transmitted diseases with dolphins, so I couldn't rightfully say. I do know, however, that you can pass the flu between you along with other respiratory problems. I got a cold when a dolphin sneezed on me once, and cleared up after a week or so. You can also pass some skin irritations onto them, if you handle them with chafed or broken skin. Just like with a human, it is best to be clean when you handle a dolphin. If you have cuts on your hands, avoid touching them unless you wash hands with a betadine surgical scrub prior to handling. This is available from most veterinary and surgical suppliers. If you have some disease of some sort, avoid mating, for the dolphin's sake. This is a little known area, more so because zoophilia is considered illegal in many places, which I think is a load of crud, but the law is the law. Is there any way I could invite a dolphin to be masturbated? Well, yes, if they are hanging around, but not looking particularly excited, but you are, you can invite them this way. And now we enter the pickup artist part of the dolphin sex instructions. Male and female dolphins can be invited by rolling them on their sides, again, but instead of going straight to the genital slit, rub along their bellies between their pectoral fins, along the navel, and every once in a while, over the genital slit. If they are responsive, they will show the signs of excitement as described earlier, and you can proceed as usual. If, however, they are not responsive, they will swim away or turn back upright. Do not force the issue with a dolphin. Trying to restrain them will only break their trust in you and could cause you serious injury. Pat them, stroke them, and talk to them lovingly, but do not try anything else. It is best, anyway, to let the dolphin tell you when they are ready. It is far more pleasant and more fulfilling anyway and more special. Wow, what a fucking simp. Where can I find a dolphin to mate with? Aquariums are a bad choice, for many reasons. Too public, the dolphins are not in their natural habitat, night visits are impossible, etc, etc. Some may have external enclosures which may be accessible, but that is no guarantee. Best thing sometimes is to find a beach or a cove that the dolphins frequent. It takes time to develop a relationship with the dolphins to the point where they will let you mate with them, although some have been as quick as three days to acclimatize. Gaining their trust takes time, and you need to visit frequently. This is impossible for some people, I understand, but it is the best way. Sometimes, you just need to be in the right place at the right time. I have been extremely lucky on two occasions with wild dolphins, and my current mate is a dolphin who lives in the harbor of my resident city. Although he doesn't go into great detail, I imagine that the difference between hooking up with an aquarium dolphin and a beach cove dolphin is comparable to the difference between hooking up with someone from the city and someone from the country. Well, I hope this is of use to whoever is interested. One final note, you should love a dolphin, not because of the sexual relief they can provide, but because they are a unique animal. One of the few wild animals that seek the company of man by their own initiative. This is special. Do not abuse it. The DolphinSex.org story would come to an end when the site changed hands a few times throughout the years. DolphinSex.org. What you need when you need it. Thinking back to when I first found this website, I think I was like maybe 14 years old, I thought the whole thing was just a joke. Maybe some kind of satire or an experiment in a weird fiction. But now that I'm much older and I've kind of seen the world that's out there, we got people walking around on Twitter with squiggly lines to let everyone know that they're zoo files. I'm erring on the side of thinking that this guy might just be legitimate. I don't know, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section. But anyway, until then, avoid the squiggly line people. Peace out.